yeah, we are live. Uh, we're going to get started in a few minutes. We're going to get people a chance to pop on. But, um, yeah, so what did you want to test? I want to check if my audio is better this way or if I use earphones. So that yeah, – Yeah, test it out. We're still going to wait for a few more minutes for people to pop on. All right. Is it better now? Yeah. Say something. Is it better now? No, I think it's worse. Okay, all right. Let me also close my door because there's the washing machine in the background. There we go. All right. Um, so we're going to do the intro first anyway, so I think we're good to go. We'll just get cracking. We got how many people on right now? It's just it's just my mom. <laughs> hey, mom. Mine, mine should be there too. <laughs> yeah, like my, mom, my mom sometimes creeps on my live streams, and then she'll like write me. She'll send me like a question. And I'll be like, what do you do if you're in love? <laughs> do you think you'll ever get married? I'm like, I know it's you, mom. Like You're the only one that asks a question like that. Am I, am I ever going to get grandkids? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> if you if you think your mom's saying that, like, can you imagine as an Indian mom, how, how, as an Indian, how much I'm going to get that from my mom? She's already been dropping things. So, it's so un-Indian for a mom to pop on like your live stream. That would be like too much. Not my live stream, not my live stream, but asking me if I'm going to get married, if I'm going to have all love, if I'm going to have babies. Exactly. So I need to, what is your lay count? Oh, my lay count. <laughs> Not, I keep saying I'm I'm, 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 I'm a complete version, you know. Yeah, I'm just saying this is what your mom would say. Uh, all right, man, so let's uh, let's get cracking. We got a good amount of people. Well, we got some people. Anyway, we're just going to get pick up. Mm -hmm. What's up, guys? Welcome to our live stream, live Q&A. We got a special fitness expert on. His name is Sadeen. He's actually a really good buddy of mine. I've known him for several years. He was one of the OGs of the Playing With Fire group. And obviously, you know, when I saw him posting questions, the one thing that stands out is that this motherfucker is Jack, and he's also Indian, which is kind of a little bit of a paradox sometimes. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> what the fuck is going on here? So, you know, we've become good friends, and he's helped me a lot with my own training. You know, I think I come to you, uh, you know, quite often with just little questions here and there, and you've definitely, you know, given me personally a lot of value, and you've also helped out a lot of the guys in the Club of Fire group. And also one thing I really like about you is that you're very, like, science objective oriented like you don't do any bro type of answers like yeah bro just fucking just lift until it feels good you know like you don't give like you just gotta feel the pump man like you you keep it very like scientific and objective which i think is ironic because your company is built by science as this is the shirt so thank you for coming on man uh do you want to just give the guys a little bit of background about yourself thanks man i mean alex it's always a pleasure to speak to you and also to the pwf community it's been, I think, what, three years now since, you know, I've been a part of it way before a lot of the other Indian members have discovered it. And it's always been a privilege, not only in terms of game, but also in terms of just knowing you guys. You know, it's always been a wonderful experience. I don't I don't think I really want to add too much more about myself um, than you have actually said. I'd rather just let the questions uh, do the talking or the answers do the talking. So let's get you want to the biceps so the guys know you're not, you're for real? What biceps? What, what oh, biceps? Oh, okay. Okay. I I see it. Let me put away my boner real quick. <laughs> All right. This, so, uh, wait, did, you, did you just trick me into a cam show? Trick you to what? Into a cam show. Uh, yeah, this is actually Playing With Fire has officially, as of yesterday, become a homosexual uh, premier dating community. So, uh, yeah. Okay, there you go. There's just more money in that. A lot more money. Um, I think while we let the questions build up, I think a good place to start is what are the biggest what are the biggest mistakes guys are making when it comes to fitness in the gym? Because I know me and you have talked about this in the past. Okay, um, are we being specific about in the gym itself? Uh, just in terms, just in terms of you know trying to get jacked, in terms of you know like getting like you see a lot of guys who have been training for two years that look exactly the same as they did you know when they first started. Just like with game, you see guys who've been doing pickup for ten years, they still suck balls. You know their leg count is still exactly the same. So I think that there's a lot of paradox, you know, there's a lot of similarities between game and uh, fitness. So what, what do you think in terms of this specifically, or guys like fucking up? Well, if you've been training for two years or whatever, however long, and you've made no progress, it comes down to two reasons, mainly that I've identified. The very first is when you go in without a plan of action, you just go in and start lifting, or you start just doing something or the other, you know? 
there is no clear plan of action or near no clearly designed program now this is more of a problem i see happening on this side of the world because maybe towards your end or to, uh, in the us and what not they they kind of understand a lot of the basics basics over here it's a lot of you know like just just let's go and do something bro you know because people is automatically associate lifting as something that's just about doing there's no thought involved you know and right. some people even go as far as saying that oh why are you why are you being a scientist you should like just like lift look at and you just all you need is hard work but it's not just that there's a science to it and there's barring unless you're someone who's incredibly genetically gifted or you know some other factors involved you are you need a certain level of sense and a certain level of science involved in your program design to be able to constantly make progression and that's the second thing i'd say and that is most people don't focus on progression they focus on things like what they feel like what feels good you know what they like and prefer and there's no clear sense of progression built into their program that's why they don't make get those results beyond the initial beginner gains so there should there should be you know a clear you know like pro progress like you should be lifting progressively heavier and heavier on key lifts day in and day out it's i would use the term progressive tension overload and the reason why i say this is because when you say progressive overload people automatically assume hey the weight has got to increase and that's it but the thing is there are ways you can increase the weight but there are, but without keeping other factors in mind like form and technique or range of motion and if those aren't kept constant or those aren't optimized then you may be lifting heavier but the tension on your muscles might not be optimal compared to what they should be you uh -huh. know for example if i lift 100 pounds uh, but i like have full range of motion in let's say my chest and if i go 120 or 130 but the range of motion is cut short the actual net tension that's on the muscle could either be the same yeah sorry yeah so it's like you're doing like the bullshit bench presses where it's just like like well, yeah there's a number of reasons why my poor form is going to hurt you one way or the other but even if you look at just tension overload the person thinks that they've increased the weight or they increase the tension in the chest but they haven't necessarily Right. because now they may be because greater range of motion adds more tension to the muscle so progressive tension overload is the, is the actual term that i would use okay. and uh, when, you, when you use a term like that you also have to keep in mind other things that besides the number on the weight you know there's um form and technique the execution speed and what not yeah yeah that makes sense um you know what well, before we jump into the fitness stuff i do want to ask how has cuz i think no one most people don't know this who don't know you well but you used to be fat right Yeah, I used to be fat, then I turned incredibly skinny, uh, and then this. So you experienced like pretty much both spectrums. You've been fat, you've been skinny. You know, skinny like dork, and then you were like, now you're like a fucking, you know, you're Jack. So you've kind of, kind of hit the triangle there. You know, um, yeah. what have your results with women? How did your results with women change when you when you got in good shape? Well, okay, I'm going to be very frank here. Um, the majority of my time when I was out of shape, I pretty much never. had women in my life um at least and even if i did uh, it was like a very long term relationship so in terms of how a physique has benefited me with women i don't really have a reference point of what it wasn't before you know i don't really have much of a reference point there what i do have is the reaction and the uh, the the way my physique has helped a lot of interactions become incredibly easy and frankly speaking the biggest ego boost you can possibly get you know because as a guy you all you don't necessarily have the all stacked with you right when we always kind of hold that little you know that that position up where they you know you're approaching them or whatever but many times i've had girls approach me and even if i approach girls um, there's an innate sense of you know ease when it comes to how open they are to talking to you because of the physique you know this is something i've heard from every single jack guy that like you have girls that actually like my dad my dad is uh, for anyone who's not familiar with dad dad used to be the fourth best bodybuilder in belarus when he was young so he still works out regularly usually if i go with him to the gym he's the guy that's lifting the most weights at the age of 55 you know what so what happened to you then hmm? <laughs> what happened to you then where did those jeans go <laughs> I'm, i'm in i'm in second place uh so my dad always says he's like yeah, you know i go to travel you know sometimes i'm by pool you know drinking and then you know oh, she come up to me You know, so like that's kind of I've heard that pretty much from every single you know guy who's in really good shape is that you'll just basically have girls approach you like from time to time. Yeah, Sometimes. you're gonna be like Owen, except for when you're not well dressed. Ah, uh, and another thing that really helps is when you when you're like kind of getting close to them, and they start feeling you, you know, and they start feeling what you've got. 
um, beyond just what's in your pants. This, you can, their expression on their face makes a difference, man. As in, I, I, oftentimes when I'm in the club and I see a girl who's like, I mean, she can see I'm, I'm Jack, but you know, what's, when you're ripped, it's even better. So when she's like you, she accidentally rubs her hand against your, your belly or chest or whatever, and she feels, you know, what she feels. That look on her face is says it all. The eyes just light up, and you know, you know, then and there that they they they've got their attention. So yeah, and there's very like practical benefits. Like I had a date last night. I think I told you about that. And um, like you know, I, I've all my life, like even when I was skinny, like right now I'm at 170 pounds. Uh, you know, low body fat, but you know, two years ago I was 135 pounds. So, but all my life, no matter how skinny I was, I would always try to, you know, pick up girls when I was escalating on dates. So, you know, when things are going, I will just like, you know, pick her up and carry her to my bed. Now, the big difference is yesterday I picked this chick up and she just felt like kind of light in my arms. And I'm just, I kind of did like one of these where I just bounced her. I'm like, she's like, I'm like, you're so skinny. She's like, no, I'm like 120 pounds. I'm like, like you're just fucking bouncing. And it's just like, it just hit me that like a year ago, like I was fucking huffing and puffing, like, fucking sweating all over the girl trying to carry her i'm like kind of like tipsy a little bit and then just like such a better look when you just confidently pick her up that's like no big deal mm -hmm. and it, it, it says in your body language as well because when you've got that confidence you it, it kind of boosts you up even more and it just adds to the whole um, alpha frame and the alpha image that that you portray not only to the girl that, that you're with but also within yourself and it just feeds it in so you feel even more confident even even more uh, you know in control of the situation because oftentimes when when uh, i'm with a girl and especially now because they always talk about the physique and they always they'll always point it out right so i just like you know just smirk and act like i'm uh, i'm not really going to talk about it too much and they they like it even more because then it just adds to that whole oh not only is this guy jack but he's not like qualifying himself he's just like super in his place and I think that really helps a lot. It comes yeah. in by nature when you when you feel very confident about yourself, it just adds to it, you know. Yeah, hundred percent. I think there's like a very there's like the triangle. We got pickup, fitness, fitness, and then we got business. And I think these three just work yeah. very synergistically. Like if you get into pickup, like it's almost likely that if you actually start getting good at it, you're gonna also try to start your own business. And you're gonna, you know, get into fitness. Like it's very rare that you see someone just do one of those. Like it's usually the kind of the like because you have the if you have the confidence and the willpower to go to the gym and like fucking bust your ass. And there's always like so many days where like you're just like you're trying but you can't like hit your records or just whatever something hurts or you're just not feeling it. But if you have the willpower to do this day in and day out, watch your diet, like count your calories. You're gonna have the willpower to get good at game. You're gonna have the willpower to start your business. And if you can't. If you're so, if you can't go to the gym and you can't force yourself to do that, you're very unlikely to also have the willpower to get good at game or start a business. So I think that like those three are just perfectly like it's like the fucking triangle. Absolutely, I think I think the one thing I would say just no matter anything else, whenever someone asks me this, uh, the greatest benefit that I that I have received from training or from fitness itself is not actually the physique; it's the mindset that goes in, the discipline that goes in, that has carried on into so many other fields. I run a business as well. It's really helped there. And it's helped with every other thing in my life. It's enriched every other aspect. So whatever you said is completely spot on. Yeah, one, one thing I like about fitness a lot is that it's it's a form of meditation. So like, if you're trying, if you're doing like a complicated lift where there's a high risk of injury, you know, like you're doing heavy incline press, right? Like if you do one wrong move, you can fucking twist your, you know, your arm. So you have to be extremely focused, like your mind, it's forced to be in the moment, like right then and there. In addition, if you want to hit your PRs, like you have to like really like, you can't have bullshit thoughts like, oh, fuck this, fuck this. Like you're not going to hit your record. So it's got to be, you also have to like fucking master your self-talk. If you can do that, it's kind of same thing with Gabe, you know, when you're with a girl and she's like kind of being bratty, you can just, instead of like bailing out, like, no, I got this. Yeah, absolutely. I, again, whenever you say that, it just relates to everything. So anyone who's lifted before and lifted consistently, They'll completely agree with what you just said. For exactly. sure. All right, so let's get uh, let's start doing some of the questions. Let's go crack into that. There's not too many right now. I'm sure they're gonna build up. I know Alex has been bulking, so I'm excited for this. I have. This is the most I've ever weighed in my life. I have never been over 170, uh, so it's pretty exciting, actually. Um, yeah. It's, it's, getting, it's getting fun because I'm like doing shit like, you know, I hated when I was like kind of in the beginning journey, like my ego would get hurt because I was the guy that was doing like the fucking pussy weights. And I felt like even though no one gives a shit, I felt like the other bros were judging me like, oh, yeah, 20s. OK, man. Nice. Let me get you the pink ones versus like now you're getting to a point where like, OK, like I'm 
not the strongest guy in the gym, but I'm getting to a point where it's like I'm in like the top 20 percent. So it's like kind of fun. Like just that like fucking rush when I pick up the fucking 60s. People are like, oh shit, my man. All right, so then we got uh Sunny, can we get your one RM stat so we know you're legit? All right, all right. Well, I'll preface this by saying that I don't really train specifically for the one RM, but um my peak one RMs for uh the bench press is about three 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 five pounds um my peak squat is a was about like 385 because i know the squat is pretty weak yeah and uh the deadlift i peaked at sorry it's a lot stronger than i am doing <laughs> yeah no i uh, I, I, I i don't want to be the one to, to quote injury but i made a really stupid mistake uh, growing up and that's really fucked up my squat um long what story sorry if you don't mind me asking what was the mistake Oh, so the mistake was I, I play basketball competitively. So I I injured my ankle. I tore the ligaments of my right ankle in 2012. Um, and the thing is, um, back then I didn't know as much as I do right now. And I followed the doctor's advice, which I know that in many cases people think is the best thing to do, but in this case it wasn't because they don't understand recovery and rehab as well as most fitness professionals. Yeah, yeah, most doctors fucking suck. I've had so much bad. Yeah, they, they, they suck really bad. You know, they have no idea in terms of fitness and, and biomechanics and whatnot. So this genius advised me to stop squatting and stop training my legs for that two months or three months that it was recovering. And the problem with that is that when you when you don't recover properly and you don't train your body to recover from the point of view of maintaining the mobility you had before, then the tissue that's growing then is going to develop scar tissue that's not going to be pliable as much and, and will restrict the range of motion. So for those two months, those two crucial months of, uh, that that um, I uh, I was training and it was the early stages of training, um, I spent like without squatting or without training legs at that time, you know, because I was advised to and I didn't know I didn't know any better. Um, and that resulted in a lot of issues with my biomechanics with squats. It took me a long time just to fix my technique after that, because oh. what's happening is my right ankle, to use a technical term, dorsiflexion or flexion at the ankle was, was more in my left ankle, but not so much in the right. Oh. And just to get that mobility, it was like a nightmare because that scar tissue is already formed. In. On the contrary, in about 2013, end of 2013, I completely uh, tore the meniscus of my right knee again because of the issues with the ankle because it just works biomechanically that way it's like a stack so if anything's wrong with the ankle something's going to happen with the knee for sure so that injury was far worse but by that one and a half year i had learned so much more about human recovery and and um, you know just rehab because of this injury the first one that i was able to completely recover from a torn meniscus without any problem and that hasn't affected my score which is a much worse injury so again knowledge saves you 10 times because if I could go back then and teach that kid that hey don't stop squatting after you got an injury use the first week or so or two weeks to just like get over the initial swelling and start training ASAP I would not be in a position like this you know I've screwed my biomechanics you know well you would probably be training with like lower weight right like you would kind of like take it easy at first or what would be your there, there is a very strategic approach to it you don't obviously go in full throttle the first day. There's a very strategic approach, but it's completely against what people believe to be. Like in my profession and my experience, 95, 98% of professionals who are who are in charge of teaching people how to recover from injuries don't have a clue what they're doing. The first time, the first thing you know is if someone tells you start icing the problem, then and there you know that they're, that they're wrong. It is whatever they're saying is. There's also a lot of like other tools, like you have, you know, peptides, which are very effective. That's what I personally use for my neck. Uh, you know, if, if you're in a place where you can do stem cells, that's like top of the line. And of yeah. course, there's stuff like, uh, you know, there's arnica cream, which can help if it's a more localized thing. So you have a turmeric, you know, there's all these like basically stuff that's also at your disposal that most people. But don't you know, have. besides besides that, the, in most cases, most people won't have access to it. And even if they did, even if you had all of that, one thing that you need to do is as the tissue is recovering, as the as the injured area is recovering, it needs to be trained. Uh -huh. It needs to be trained to know what's this, what range of motion that tissue is supposed to have. Yeah. For example, true. if you if you've torn your your ligament, which I did back then, uh, when it's when the body's repairing it, it's going to create scar tissue. Okay. It's never going to be as good as the original, but you can make it as good as the original as long as you train it while it's being while it's being sewn together by the body. If you train it to know that, hey, this is the range of motion it's supposed to work on. Imagine if you keep it completely sedentary or you don't move it. Then when the body creates tissue, it's creating it to be to work only in that range. 
So when you step beyond that, it starts hurting and it won't let you. But if as you're recovering, if you train it with light mobilization drills and you oh, get- uh, Yeah, yeah. So just to yeah. get back to Mr. Dumonti's uh, question, ah, yeah. what, what, what are the other stats? So three, 335 for, for bench, 385, 390-ish for squat. And um, the deadlift would probably be, I think the best was about 513 or 515 or something. Um, so yeah. Dude, I honestly, personally, I never, I don't even like to do one rep mass, maxes because I feel like they're like, that's like how you're going to get injured. Like I, I want to, I'm not going to move up and wait unless I can comfortably do six or seven reps of that. Like I'm, I'm just going to stay at lower weight. If I can't yeah, do I, it five times, I'm not moving up. I haven't, I haven't listened, you know, specifically focused on what I'm training alone as, as such. Um, so what, whatever numbers I'm sharing are like numbers that I keep in the sales zone. I haven't, I haven't really pushed to that extent. For the same reason that there's it's unnecessary it doesn't fit into my goals of training which is my goals of training aren't pure powerlifting they aren't pure bodybuilding either it's what we call as power building so to speak so i will test a one rm very occasionally maybe like once a year or twice a year maybe but that's it and i won't really push it to the point where as a, a let's say a powerlifter would whose entire training regimen is revolves around the one rm of these three lifts so Dude, my that's broker, I just I want to look good. I want to feel good. I want to not have injuries. Like those are like the main things for me. I don't really give a fuck if I'm the strongest guy. Like how much I can lift. Like I don't really care. Like all about like aesthetics and just how I feel. All right. So what's the next question? Yo, is your nose broken? Yes. For the two hundred, <laughs> I broke my nose when I was sixteen. Had an operation on it, uh, and they healed a little crooked. One seventy. Damn, that's really good progress, man. Respect. Thanks, bro. Appreciate it. India has a conservative culture, right? Is picking up girls considered normal? Well, normal, no. Uh, you know, awesome. This, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but I think I think here's the thing, right? Um, a lot of problems that come about with, um, I would say, picking up or other not just picking up or other approaching people is a normal thing. We strayed away from the normal. Our normal is wrong. You know. Because we've, we've got an entire culture of teaching people that you've got to be like very shy and reserved and you you know you can't approach people and you can't talk to people and you can't it's really stupid you know and it's really it. hard. yeah and it's i mean it causes a lot of problems um on an individual level i associate a lot of problems with the indian mindset the mindset of indian guys you know a lot of even for that matter rape you know i know it's a very touchy subject but i i would attribute a lot of that to you know this societal um, shunning of any kind of relationship or sex for that matter, because it creates this mindset that it's something that, you know, it's, you can't get it. And then you, when you stifle people's natural urges, you know, to want to talk to people, want to get to know somebody of the opposite sex, you, you try and stifle that it starts manifesting in very weird ways. You have guys who don't know how to talk to women and therefore don't know how to handle women or how to approach them or how to handle sex for that matter. And then they start developing these very weird, you know, ideas and very weird desires and to the point where it gets to desperation. You know, so I think uh, it isn't considered normal, but it should be because that is normal. Um, you know, approaching people, talking to people, and you know, finding finding out how they are and who they are, and just getting to know them is normal. And we strayed away from the normal, which is why you know things are weird. The dating scene is very weird in India. I mean, I think quite often you have to stray away from normal because uh, the normal is usually the average. Normal is it's not like the normal is like a bunch of guys who are having living a baller lifestyle and happy and fucking jacked and rich and have models. That's not the normal. Normal is just some dude who's fucking in a fucking broken marriage where his wife just nags, nags, nags at him. He makes like fucking has to has a boss who rides his ass. Like that's like considered the normal. So I want to get the fuck out of the normal personally. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think also another observation I have is just whenever you suppress like something, it usually backfires and creates a lot of like really weird behavior. So that's why you have like, no offense to anyone who falls into this, but I'm sure you guys can relate. Like someone who's from the Middle East, that's like the most sexually repressed culture, and they're like fucking doing some really fucked up shit in terms of sex. You know, like like some fucked up shit. So you have that. Like it's it's, it's funny you mentioned the word shit. I'm just gonna toss that in there. Yeah. For those of you who get it, for those of you who get yeah, it, right? Yeah. I mean, I could I could go into detail. I just don't want to get shut down. <laughs> by youtube for uh, whatever anyway so yeah so i think that's uh, i agree with you on that all right damn sunit bench is fire it's just something that has come more natural to me and that's another thing you got to keep in mind some people will naturally be gifted in certain lifts because of your your body structure um and just genetics compared to others like i have 
I've almost never like done a flat bench press. I've rarely done a flat bench press ever. I've always focused on dumbbell pressing um, because from a muscle building point of view, um, decline and incline presses and dumbbell presses are superior to flat barbell presses. Yeah, um, dude, I never, that's funny. I never do, uh, maybe I learned this from you. I never really do flat. I don't do barbells. I do uh, incline press with uh, dumbbells. If you're somebody who wants to build a great chest, if you're somebody who wants to build more muscle and general strength, um, you have much better options than the flat bench press. The, the decline bench press um, and incline bench press work better in combination than flat and using dumbbells better than barbells, significantly better. If Is that because you just have more shoulder stability, you're forced to develop shoulder stability or what's the... There are, there are three reasons. One is what we call as an isolateral advantage where each side is working independent of the other. So in a dumbbell, in a, in a barbell, what happens is since you're working a bilateral movement, both of your arms are putting force on the same object. So if one side happens to contract a little weaker, let's say your left side, you know, the right side compensates for it. And therefore that imbalance that can take place in terms of strength on both sides you know, doesn't really get bridged over time. But if you lift to dumbbells, what happens is the isolateral advantage makes sure that the, the, you have the same weight on each side and one side doesn't uh, you know help the other so gotcha. both have been currently like built together and they kind of even out relatively more first thing second thing uh comes down to stability um the barbell press if you if you look at it you, your, your shoulders kind of stabilize it across two forms you stabilize it like from going up and down and you stabilize it from going side to side but that's it if you look at dumbbells you have to also stabilize in and out the yeah. internal stabilization is not there with uh, barbell presses. So that adds to better shoulder stability and strength. And over time gets you generally stronger than just that unidimensional pushing. Number two. Uh, and number three, there is a slight benefit in terms of range of motion as well. Because you can, the dumbbell can go a little bit lower than the barbell can the barbell yeah. touch your chest. So there's a third advantage there. And these three things in com combination will give you a better result and better tension on the muscle compared to a bench press. Got it. You know, I was just thinking as you were talking about this, guys often ask me, you know, about stats. Like, what are your stats with online? How many matches do you get? What percentage of those girls do you get out? What percentage of those do you bang? Well, can you give guys a ballpark with fitness stats? Like, you know, like what, how much, for example, should you be incline pressing before, you know, you know, like you're intermediate, then you're advanced, like just like a ballpark. Uh, see, again, you know, this is, this is, um, something that you can't use a blanket statement or blanket numbers on. Dude, welcome to my world. I know, I know exactly what you mean. It's like a rough yeah. ballpark. Yeah, you know, um, because again, it's like, I, I would literally be putting, I'm not literally, but I would be figuratively putting numbers out of my ass if I were to say that. Um, there are, if you look at, a, if you look at powerlifting as an example, uh, they might define like, you know, a certain class, a certain weight that you lift in the three lifts that can put you as a beginner, intermediate, or advanced compared to the rest of the world. You know, there there are some standards. I don't remember the exacts, but if you, anyone can pull up a chart there. Um, but if you look at other lifts, there isn't much of a reference as such. And why it's so different, why you cannot really put down a number as such to that is because um, body weight matters, firstly. You know, if, you, if you're a 60 kilo guy versus an 80 kilo guy versus a 100 kilo guy, your standards are different. You know, um, your, your average or your intermediate or advanced might be different depending on race. Because I could be like, I've been lifting all these years and I have these numbers and then there could be like a black. Blue all right, all right. Penny, let me rephrase the question. I, 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 as of recently, I can do five sets of five pull-ups. Is that good? Okay. Bad average? What's the, uh, where does that fall? It depends in? because what's your body weight? You know? 170. Yeah, 170. Five sets of five pull-ups is okay, I guess, you know. It's average. Are, it's, I mean, I, I wouldn't, uh, 175, five reps. Five sets means good volume, but five reps in a, in a stretch, is that, is that, is that a failure? Like, is yeah, that I, I, well, until my form starts to break down, because I don't like to strain my neck when I'm doing the back. Yeah, okay, okay. That's how much I can do with like good form. I, I'd say I'd say it's pretty okay. It's like it's not bad, but it's not not so good either. You know? There's, there's, there's room there's yeah. room for improvement a lot of room. yeah for sure for sure i definitely hopefully i improve then also for example for incline press i can do um with 70 pound dumbbells uh maybe like uh four sets of eight like four uh four sets of eight reps where, where would that fall into but like with what weight hmm? with what weight 70 pound dumbbells Pretty, I mean, it's pretty good actually. Seventy pounds weight reps at, at uh, one seventy is pretty decent. You know, but then again, see, I'm, it's like me giving my subjective opinion on it. You know, um, for some, like I don't know what your potential is. Your potential could be much more. 
yeah. you could be reaching you could be reaching the max of your potential because if i if i take in two people you know two very different individuals of the same race or whatever one person just might have much more potential than the other it's just the way it works you know yeah, dude, I, I totally know what you mean and i i also kind of have that reaction when people ask me about sets the stats because it matters where you live what your baseline yeah. looks are, what your type is, how sustainable. So there's all these factors that go into play, you know, when it comes to, you know, figuring out whether the results are good. But I think it's also still just a good idea to have like a rough ballpark. Like I can tell, for example, that if you're getting like 10% of your matches, if you're getting them on dates, you're on the right track. Like again, your standards, where you live are huge, huge factors. If it's like 1%, you're off. And if it's, you say 40%, then you're lying to me, right? If you're banking 50% of your dates, then you're more or less on the right track. You know what I mean? Because those, but that's a that's a domain where those numbers you can actually that that can logically translate into analysis there. But you you can't. I don't. Like, give me an example of how this can work with with um, with lifts. Because um, you know, okay, what you can say is if you're let's say your squat and bench press is very disproportionate. You know, um, maybe sure. if you can lift like one and a half times your body weight or two times your body weight in squats, but then your bench press is like barely any. Yeah, maybe by that comparison you could. Yeah. But you know, it's again, it really depends a lot. So I, I, I wouldn't bench press one and a half times your body weight. Then you're fucking, you know, you're, yeah. per, you're probably very, you know, probably very much, you know, in the yeah. top one yeah. percent. If it's like half your body weight, then you have a long way to go, junior. Yeah, sure. like that's the long lines of that. Yeah, all right. Let's uh, let's see what else we got. I'm pretty skinny guy looking to gain some weight. A friend recommend I take creatine supplements before working out. What are your thoughts on creatine, good or bad? Creatine is actually one of the most well-researched supplements out there because it's one of those few supplements that A, cost very less and B, actually show results, you know? So creatine does work. Creatine works um, very evidently. But two things. First, it, it's not a magical thing that's going to make not, it. It's not like steroids. Yeah. It's, not, it's going to, not going to come close to steroids, but it's the closest thing you'll probably get um, to having actually visible results in a supplement. Otherwise, 90% of the supplements are not going to do that for you. Yeah. That being said, you should also be aware that there are 30% of people that take creatine that are non-responders. That you take creatine, but you don't get the benefits. I happen to be one of them. Oh. Okay, so you won't. You, I haven't seen any gain in performance. I haven't seen any gain in, in weight. Typically, when you when you start taking creatine, um, after you, after you, yeah, you start getting like a, a noticeable weight gain um, post that. You know, it, it's mainly water weight. It's mainly just um, retention of water, but you still see that gain. You know. In right. some people, and this is actually recorded, about 70% of people, it works for 30% are non-responders. So for those, it won't. To try, you can try it out and see there's nothing bad about it. Yeah, it can't hurt. It's cheap. There's no downside. Yeah, it, it, there's very little downside to it. There is this, this some um, you know doubt that creatine can result to some level of hair loss, but that isn't really supported as much with evidence. Uh, there's a lot of conflicting evidence there, and um, the, the evidence is inconclusive. So... There isn't any downside as such that's recognized and, and accepted. And yeah, you can definitely try creatine. It should help unless you're somebody who's a non-responder. In which case, steroids it is. All right, so what else we got? Imagine if RSD look, <laughs> Luke did a live on bulking advice. That would be quite hilarious. Okay, who, I, I, I need context here. How does RSD look, RSD look, look like? He's extremely obese. Imagine if he was doing, he's like, all right, guys, I'm not fat. I'm just bulking, okay? I'm just putting on mass. Like, you guys are fucking too skinny. I'm just trying to put on mass here. Mm. Yeah. I feel like, okay, here's, here, this is a side tangent. I feel like you shouldn't be coaching pickup unless you don't have to be in great shape, but you should be like, if you don't have the self-control to just be in decent shape, then you probably don't have the self-control to, you know, teach game, you know, talk about game or anything like that. I mean, there's going to be some very small exceptions here. Uh, but generally speaking, I feel like that's kind of, you know, like, it's like, come on. Yeah, the, the mindset carries over, you know, yeah. if, you, if you don't have the, I, I, it's a lot about the mindset and you're right. In the sense, it speaks a lot about the person. I would rather instead, I would, I would say the person listening should be very, very selective on who they listen to, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know what really cracks me up? Like the personal trainers who are like in worse shape than their clients. You have like the personal trainers, just some skinny weakling. And I'm like, wait, like you should be training this guy. Like what the fuck is going on here? Like I, I would never take fitness advice from someone who's not in like fucking way better shape than me. Mm. That's just my, my, my two cents. All right. What's the best recommendation for home workouts? Okay. Uh, as somebody who's never been a fan of home workouts, I was forced to, <laughs> given given the lockdown. And uh, thankfully, it's it's in a way it's a learning lesson because it made it made me 
evaluate a lot of things in training and find an alternative when there was no op no option. Um, home workouts can be and should be and should follow the same principle that you do at um, at the gym, where you don't magically assume that just because you're at home, you know you can suddenly do five sets of fifty push-ups and that's going to work better than a than heavy bench press. It's not. You know, muscle building happens within a certain range of reps. Anything beyond that, you're just like, you're not training for muscle building. Um, so you follow the same principles, you follow progression, you follow, um, and again, what you do is you kind of like make sure you cover all the muscles and all functions. And one thing that you will, that will really help you doing that is investing in good resistance bands, because there are a lot of movements that you can't really apply resistance to without, um, you know, it's like a band or something. You may do push-ups, you might do pull-ups. I mean, if you have a place to do pull-ups, firstly. Um, I think you should like, you can get a pull-up bar. They're like 20 bucks on Amazon. It's like totally worth it. Yeah, but like, for example, you know, the pull-up bars you're talking about, they work very well with the with how the doors are at your, in the U.S. I actually bought one from the U.S. when I was there, but it doesn't work in, in, in Indian door frames, you know? Really? For example. So we okay. don't, yeah, you guys have a different door frame, so you can do that, but we can't. So, yeah, uh, having a set of have resistance bands really helps because they are movements that you otherwise would not load. For example, if I want to train my, my, my side delts, there's no other way that I can do a lateral raise than using resistance bands, you know. So they really help a lot. Um, that's the first thing. And second thing, I would, I would get a professional, ideally, to develop a good, very sound, very well put together home workout because they're going to keep in mind all those other practical applications that you know have to be considered when you're designing a home workout like i could you could squat you could do body weight squats but how much are you going to really add resistance to it if you if you're somebody who's squatting even even your body weight um like plus your plus whatever body weight equivalent of the bar it's not going to create results for you so you're going to have to find alternatives like let's say a pistol squat you know learning how to do a single leg squat onto a box and starting from this so that's again challenging you know something find something that's challenging enough to train your muscles within the 8 to 12 rep range and if you if you can do 12 reps easy try to add to find some way to add resistance then you'll be able to start still making progress still make progression yeah another thing i'll say is uh invest in adjustable dumbbells like you can do a lot with adjustable dumbbells that go up to like five to 45 pounds like you can hit overhead press you can hit lateral raises you can hit rows there's like obviously it's not gonna be nearly as good as a gym and you know we have access to unlimited machines but like if you get adjustable dumbbells like you can significantly you can hit biceps you can hit triceps you can get very creative with that the, the, pro, the i would i would recommend adjustable dumbbells any day over bands because the one thing i hate about bands is that you have to keep adjusting them and they can get really irritating to deal with but yeah. the problem is that adjustable dumbbell sets tend to be more expensive you could get yeah. like the bands are going to be significantly cheaper and it might not be in everybody's budget to to invest in adjustable dumbbells and that's that's the reason i went with with bands because they're cheaper they're easy to store and uh, you know you get like a wide range of resistance and also in certain movements which you otherwise can't use a dumbbell for example if i want to train leg curls you know one big problem when it comes to home workouts is how do you train the hamstrings the only way you can do that is using resistance bands like maybe you could try to find something to like hold with your legs and do but it's not going to have the same effect because most of the range of motion you don't have resistance so that's an example right there you know of how having resistance bands could really help yeah so, i think i think if you have the means just get both uh you yeah. know if you live in the us you can just do amazon returning 29 days later get your money back <laughs> i mean you know it's kind of cheap but these are just for time uh yeah. one quick one quick thing i will add to that is uh don't make the mistake i did so when the quarantine started i got a pull-up bar and i was like well i'm just gonna fucking do pull-ups all the time because you know i'm gonna take this quarantine just get really strong at pull-ups mm -hmm. in a week i developed tennis elbows from going from by increasing my pull-up amount by like a thousand percent you know just constantly doing pull-ups so you gotta you gotta be progressive about it. and that fucking tennis elbow lasts at three months like at first i was making a lot of gains because i was always doing pull-ups and then i fucking way backtrack now just kind of getting back to where i was so i would say also just kind of be reasonable about your uh workload yeah there's there's one thing about workload is also remember the muscles work as yin and yang they work as you know um like agonist and antagonist so to speak so if you're building one muscle and you keep focusing on those sets of muscles the opposite muscles if they don't develop at the same time you can start developing issues and, and pains and injuries for example the biceps and triceps work against each other Right. If I keep, you know, working on my biceps and I don't work on my triceps, I am going to face problem in my elbow joint because the, the the pull of my bicep on my elbow joint is a lot more than the pull of my tricep. 
So it is going to create un disproportionate forces on the joint if one muscle is developed a lot more or worked a lot more than its opposite. So that balance has to be kept in mind. And when you design a good program, uh, a professional who knows what he's doing will keep all, all those things in mind and make sure that the volume that each muscle group has is balanced. Yeah, and well, it's easy to do that when it comes to bigger muscles. Like you know that the quads and the hamstrings, you can balance it out. But a lot of people don't understand that the opposite of the chest is not the back. What's the opposite of chest? You know, the opposite of this is actually, it's, it's this real, this tiny muscle called the rear delt. That oh. little tiny muscle called the rear delt is what's opposite to this. So you see a lot of these jack guys, they're always like this. You know, they're like in, like gorillas, you know, because they constantly work the chest and they get really strong, but they don't work on the rear delts to get the shoulder back in balance. Hey, I think the lats are the so they What's the best way to train the rear delt? Because I think it's a muscle group that most people just kind of forget about. Yeah. If, if you want to be aesthetic, if you want to have good shoulders, the rear delt is the most ignored muscle group of, of them all. And if you want to train it well, um, I would say there are three exercises that are, are my go-tos. Uh, think from the point of view of function as opposed to the point of view of exercises, then you'll understand where you can apply this function. So the rear delt has two functions. One is what we call as transverse extension, where you keeping the, the um, upper arm parallel to the floor, you go out. So it's the opposite of a fly. You see why it's, a, it's the exact opposite muscle of the chest now? Because it does the exact opposite thing as the chest does. So when you, when you fly inward, the exact opposite, a rear fly, is what would work the rear delt, number one. The second thing that the rear delt does is what's called as shoulder hyperextension. So if you extend your shoulder, this is this is flexion and this is extension. If you extend your shoulder beyond what's normal, which is hyperextension, that also works the rear delt. So if you want to train the rear delt, there are two ways to go about it. Exercises that do what's called as transverse extension. That means it's a rear fly or a row, which, which you keep your upper arm parallel to the floor. That's one set. And the second set would be something called as um, hyperextension. So you kind of stand with like weights in your hand and then just kind of row them upwards strictly. These two oh, movements right. will, will work your rear delt the best. OK, cool. Gotcha. I'm going to try the hyperextension stuff. I never tried that. All right, so for someone that doesn't like working out, uh, I think it comes down to why do you not like working out? Do you just hate? Like, I feel like I've never met someone who actually gave it a really solid shot that did like it. I feel Alex, like I, I want him to continue. I want him to just elaborate a little bit. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, go ahead, um, Jay-Z, right? They can just, just tell us more exactly what do you not like about working out? He's too busy fucking Beyonce. He doesn't have time to work out. <laughs> All right, do you do any cardio? Do I? Absolutely. I think cardio is one of the most underrated things when it comes to like men tend to kind of under underemphasize guys who want to build muscle to and to underemphasize cardio a lot. And I would argue that cardio not only is something that you have to you should do, it actually helps you in building muscle. Yeah. Contrary to what people say, right? Also, yeah, my cardio days. Mm. So here's the thing though. Your your heart is also a muscle. It's the most important muscle in your body. If you're going to work the other muscles in your body, you're not going to work your heart. That's stupid. You know, also, if your heart isn't going to be, you know, getting stronger uh, and getting, you know, better in performance compared to the rest of your body, at some point when you're bigger, right? When you're bigger, you have more like blood that your muscles need. You need like your, you need to have a certain level of cardiac output to be able to keep up with that big frame of yours. And you oftentimes find people who get really big and jacked, but they are gassed out after a set like no other, you know? Like they just, it's as if they ran a freaking marathon or something. And you know what that means, what that says? It says that there's so much gains left on the table because if you didn't have that limitation, if you, were, if you weren't going to be gassed out so much because of cardio, even though that movement is not even taxing cardio so much, that means you could have gone for more reps. You could have probably recovered faster and better. Your performance could have been better otherwise. You know, I've oftentimes, there, there are very few moments where you know, because of injury or because of whatever reason, my car, uh, my cardio work has reduced, and I have seen it affect my lifts clearly, because the rate of recovery uh, changes. You know, I get tired more often, and um, you know, it, it indirectly affects muscle building to a significant extent. So, I mean, what is like the least amount of cardio that you can get away with? Firstly, I think it's it's less about least amount and more about um, find a style that works for you. For me, I get it. Cardio is the most boring thing in the world. I could never run on the treadmill barely have in the in all these wow. years of game, wow. you know there's, there's the holocaust and then there's cardio right like yeah but what i would do is i would actually find cardio that fits into whatever you enjoy doing find something that's taxing that's going to get you moving that's going to get your heart rate up 
but something that you enjoy doing. Now this That's could be right. any vigorous sex count. Vigorous sex could count actually, <laughs> but oh, not as much as the other. Yeah. Uh, ideally, play a sport because the sport is not only going to work on cardio, but it's going to be fun, and it's also going to challenge you and your muscles in ways that you otherwise wouldn't in the monotonous card in monotonous running. You know, with running, it's a repetitive set of same movements. One of the things that I love to do with cardio is basketball. Now, I don't do I don't do basketball because I want to do cardio. I do basketball because I love playing the sport. I've been playing the sport for a very long time. But that's the best cardio that I could get because it makes me move in so many different ways and jump and whatnot without me thinking about it. So if you really want to do cardio, do something that you enjoy. It could be swimming. It could be like soccer. It could be any sport that involves a lot of movement and gets you taxed. I like fucking hot girls. So you're, you're saying legit that counts? Like if I fuck a girl for an hour, that's my cardio for the day? See, the, the thing is that it doesn't uh, fucking really, rarely ever pushes you and pushes your heart to the point where you're like really ex like oh, dude. huffing and puffing. You know? I'm huffing and puffing. I like sweating on her. Then, you, then, then your cardio is pretty bad, dude. Then your really cardio is pretty bad. No offense, but your cardio is pretty bad then. <laughs> dude, I, 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 and here's another benefit. If you really want to be motivated to fuck and to be able to like do better, like do cardio. Um, an average session, like when I, I'm, I'm typically fucking a girl for like two and a half, three hours and, and never taking a break. You're uh, it also three hours? Yeah. Really? I, 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 I don't, I don't. Like shit gets boring after like an hour. It's like, it, it, it does get boring. It does get boring, which over time I've kind of like, you know, over, like, in, and I started when I first started and, and um, I've always had very good control over myself in terms of like complete control over myself. So I would go like in the, in the beginning time, I would like thoroughly go two hours, three hours, whenever until the girl taps out. Now I kind of like hold back myself because, you know, at some point it gets boring. Yes. But the ability to do that doesn't change. Right. And it, I think cardio helps a lot with that. It also yeah. helps with strong directions. If you uh, some, again, girls, like, keep up. Like some girls, some girls are like, baby, are you going to come? Because I really want you to come because yeah. I'm getting sore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Personally, I do like, typically my sessions like half an hour, and then sometimes it goes over an hour, but typically half an hour. My general thing is not so much about the time, but like to get the girl to come a few times, right? So yeah. she has full orgasms so that I come. Like that's generally yeah. my baseline. Uh, but I have. So to I think we, we we just kind of the, the main the main topic was that you you need good cardio, and if you're getting tired with something like sex, which is even even at, at its most vigorous, because let me put it this way, you're comparing let's say compare basketball to the most most vigorous sex possible. It just can't compare because basketball is going to be a lot more taxing and generally. So someone who plays basketball and like properly plays basketball and exhausts himself might not have been never come close to that level of exhaustion, even if that person's like literally banging away with sex. So, you know, what if I think guy's wife and then he starts chasing after me and I have to run really fast to get away from him. That might work. That might work. <laughs> I'll try something like that. All right. So we got, I do enjoy Stairmaster and long walks. Okay. Just an observation. Um, I, I also oh, long okay. walk. I, I, since you mentioned long walks, remember there are two kinds of cardio. There's the cardio that's steady state, so it's low intensity and for long duration. And then there's high intensity interval training, you know, so which is more like uh, what we call as anaerobic training, aerobic versus anaerobic. What you should do, which you should go with, would really depend on your personal preferences and your goals. Um, if personally, the most athletic people, the ones who want to maintain as much muscle as possible, the ones who want to have high power output, the ones who want to have that jacked and you know like strong physique, tend to favor. It's you're you're better off trying to go for more high intensity work, because when you do a lot of low intensity work, um, you know it um, at some level it compromises muscle gain, and also it's it really depends. You know, <laughs> I mean, um, but at the same time, if you're somebody who's very massively overweight or you haven't had experience in high intensity training, never start with that. Always go gradual into it. So I personally favor more towards high intensity anaerobic stuff with some aerobic work, which has resulted in some my aerobic cardio not being so great, you know, so obviously maybe there's something I could work on too. But if you're really looking from the point of view of fat loss, if you're looking from the point of view of an overall physique, um, I would gradually start working towards going to more high intensity work. Got it. All right, let's see what else we got. Beginner can add five pounds to lifts every workout. Intermediate can no longer do that. They have to add five pounds to lifts every week. Yeah, for sure. Again, a blanket blanket statement, but yes, beginners can beginners defined as someone who can progress workout to workout. That's a, that's a more technical uh, or appropriate term, workout to workout. Um, intermediates are the ones who can progress between what we call as a, a, me, a meso cycle, you know, so to speak, which is like a let's say a month if you take in my a month or week or whatever you break it down to, 
and uh, an advance could be somebody who, who progresses over like a like a large meso cycle or a, micro, or a macro cycle which is like yeah. multiple months in place yeah i mean if you could make beginner gains after two three years of training like you'd have so many fucking jack dudes walking around like i would you know like beginner gains are probably like to the, like it's almost like taking steroids or something like you're like making like yeah. probably like insane progress that like you will not after six months of training but one quick aside i don't know what you think about this but it's just a personal observation uh, so with the quarantine, obviously, I couldn't go to the gym for like two months. So I was just doing a lot of at-home stuff. I couldn't really do like, you know, really heavy weights and stuff like that. And before before the quarantine, I had hit like kind of a little bit of a plateau like last two months where I just wasn't like, I think it's very slow progress, but barely. I was stuck on certain lifts and I just couldn't overcome that. Then the quarantine happened. Two months, I did something completely different. And then I went back into my usual routine and I just made tr like beginner progress where I just literally like, took it to the next level within like three weeks to a month. Is that something that you've seen before? Um, y yes, and there could be a few reasons for that. One could be the fact that, I, for example, even with me, um, when I started doing beginner, say, home workouts, one of the things that I was focusing on is uh, pistol squats, you know, uh, which is single leg squat. It's very difficult to do, and even as somebody who can squat like easily over one and a half times my body weight, um, a single leg pistol squat is really challenging. Now, what it did end up doing is when I finally got to the gym and started doing squats again, I noticed that my mobility increased significantly and therefore it made my squat a lot more comfortable, you know? So there are a lot of these tiny factors that come in place. You could improve mobility because of a movement that you would now do that you weren't otherwise doing before. You could also improve muscular imbalances. Yeah, For example, I'm doing a lot of shoulder stabilization work. I was doing yeah. a lot of distance bands, yeah. stuff like so, that. So, so, so imbalance work and stability work is very underrated because that can actually help breakthrough plateaus that were initially there because of it. If you've yeah. got shoulder imbalances, you are affecting training for your chest, your your uh, your your lats, your um, you know, your arms for that matter if you're doing comp if you're doing compound movements. And to some extent even the legs if you're doing things like overhead squats, you know? So simply by working and fixing that stability and mobility, you could make gains and make improvements which was otherwise there in your potential but you couldn't tap into because that was limiting you before. So such elements and such factors can can contribute and help you make progress or break break your uh, plateaus before because they identify and they fix issues that were there but were never really addressed before. Yeah, for sure, man, for sure. Um, I just did 100 push-ups in three minutes while watching you guys. Oh, shit. 100 push-ups in three minutes. Okay. I can't. I, can, I, can, I cannot do that. I can do like four sets of 25 push-ups. I, I, I could do that in like uh, a minute or less than that. But the problem is I, I get bored. <laughs> like for me, it's a mental thing more than anything else. Like, yeah, I, 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 don't get, I get really know. bored. I get really bored with movements that involve anything more than 12 reps. Yeah, I, I 100% the same way. Like and there has to be that challenge for me to stay mentally engaged. That's why I like yeah. doing like, like heavy weights where it's like I can do maybe seven, eight reps max. So it's like that real challenge. And it's like kind of like there's like a little bit of that risk. Like, oh, shit, is my shoulder going to fucking buckle? I kind of like that. Do you right. believe Mike O'Hara is natural? Um, do I believe uh, Mia Khalifa's tits are real? <laughs> of course they are, man. Yeah, of course they are. She just got a nose job. Uh, I saw her on, on her Instagram. But uh, she seems like quite a, like a fascinating person, to be honest. Apparently, the story is that she was walking around uh, – just walking around South Florida one day and some guy came up to her and he was like, Hey, you're really cute. Do you, have you ever modeled? And she's like, she was like 18 and nine. She's like, no, I haven't. He's like, you should come and model for us. And then it turns out to be like a porn studio. And she's like, okay. So I just made the porn out and that's kind of how it started. But so another fun fact I want to show about Mia Khalifa, uh, because I do have a little bit of a crush on her. So the guy that she's married to now actually met her by sliding into her, no, yeah, by sliding into her DMs. But you know, like married to a porn star, I wouldn't. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this just shows you that online game, you know, can work. Like this guy literally slid into her DMs. I mean, he did have like he was like a famous chef or something like that, so he did have some status. But I just find that fascinating. Or, or you, or you can be Jeff Powell. I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but you could be Jeff. Jeff's like a god when it comes to ID game, isn't he? Yeah, he's quite good for sure. Um, can you can you work abs and calves every day? If those are the only two muscles in the body that doesn't need rest and can be worked every day. First of all, I, how on what basis are you saying those two muscles don't need rest? 
he's just asking a question. He's just asking, can you work abs and calves every day? Oh, if so, if so, are those the only two? Okay, sorry, my bad, my bad. Um, no, they're, they aren't the, the, every muscle requires rest. It just comes down to how much volume that you train it with. Uh, and the, the problem is sometimes when it comes to certain muscle groups like abs and calves, people tend to overtrain and do too much. You know, you're not going to get better looking abs by, by training it every single day. You're not going to get more is not necessarily better. When it comes to abs, if you really want good popping abs, you, you A, don't want to need to train it every day. You need to train it well with good resistance, like any other muscle. So it's not like you start doing 25 crunches or 30 crunches or 100 crunches. Find a way to load those crunches and, again, train in the 8 to 12 or max 15 rep range so that you can actually build muscle. Then give it time to recover. So every alternate day should be quite good. Um, calves, again. Now, calves is one of those areas and, you know, just like forearms where it depends so much on genetics that... You know, if you if you if you got like a really screwed up calf genetic, uh, you there's very little you can do to start making insane progress. You're probably not going to make insane progress to have the greatest calves, but uh, I would still put the same recommendation: maybe twice or thrice a week tops. Um, train it with progressive resistance. Give it um, you know enough volume, so maybe like four sets or five sets, maybe if you really want to focus on your calves, and that's about it. But I wouldn't recommend oh, training. Just wear sweatpants. Sorry? If all else, <laughs> else just wear sweatpants. Man, problem solved. Uh, yeah. All right. So, what else do we have? Uh, Sunid really knows his stuff. Great live stream. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Michael. <laughs> yeah. By the way, what are some exercises you recommend working on your stability aside from pistol squats? That's a good question. Okay. All right. So, Again, I want to emphasize when the, they say the word stability, please bear in mind that those movements that involve you to be in an unstable surface are not stability exercises. You do not work on stability by sitting and squatting on a bozo ball or whatever. I want to preface that by saying people misinterpret the term stability a lot. You know, so, so stability training is not when you train when you're in an unstable surface. Let's get that out of the way. Second thing, if you're looking at stability, a lot of the exercises that are muscle building exercise or lifting exercise in the gym are stability exercises. They all work on stability. It's just some work more than the other. For example, if you want to work on the stability of your <clears throat> of your hip bucket, you there's a movement that you absolutely must do, and that is a, a form of single-legged leg training. So single leg training, which is lunges or step ups. Because your your body um, is designed, we walk as bipeds. You know, we walk with one leg over the other, unlike most other mammals. And the reason we can do that is because of well-developed glutes and the stability of the hip bucket, you know, that we have so we, we don't topple over each other or over one leg or the other. The only way to train that is using movements that involve a single leg. So lunges and step ups, they work your stability of your hip immensely. So if you're training what legs, split squats, those are, the, those are what I do for my one leg. Are those good? Again, they're, they're, they're fine from the point of view of training the hip bucket, but again, there's better movements available. So okay. when it comes to training, there's, it's very rarely do you find a class of exercise that are completely useless. There are some, but very rarely. You know, there are some that, that are pretty okay, but there are some that are optimal, that are better than the others. Oh. So if I'm looking at a single-legged lunge form of training, the most basic form would be a static lunge, you know, or a split squat or whatever. It's, it's, it's okay. It, it serves the purpose of training one leg at a time. It serves the purpose of stabilizing the hip bucket. But there is a movement that's even better, and that is a dynamic dynamic lunge. So where you're standing still, and then you instead of moving backward, uh, or even if you're moving, you're moving kind of forward with your leg. You plant it. You you go into the lunge, and you push back into the starting position. So there's an explosive element to it as well. Uh -huh. you know? That's not only that's again more challenging stability. It also improves power output. So these things, again, good, better, best. No, yeah, yeah. Um, now, chest press training, you know, if you simply substitute uh, a bench press with dumbbell presses, you're working on stability better than with no other magical stability exercise. There are very few so-called stability exercises that are done purely from the point of view of stability. Even if they are, they're more from a rehab perspective, because if you have a problem with your shoulder and mobility and you're trying to work on that, that's a different thing. But if you generally apply better choices of exercises in your training, you will automatically cover a lot of areas of stability. A lot of them. Can you give me a second, please? I'll just yeah. I'll, if you, I don't know if that 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 sound is disturbing you guys, but let's go. Let's go. Yeah. Okay. I can say from the point of someone who has had to rehab my shoulders and my neck, that for stability, the you know the main things that my PT recommended are what he calls A's, T's, and Y's, and these are these train like the uh, 
the the middle to lower back, which is often goes under train. Like it's not something you really hit when you do pull ups. So basically, it's like Y's, and this is with resistance band T's, and then A's, and then you basically hit like the lower lower fucking whatever the, whatever the fuck they're called. Yeah, but see that that is again from a rehab point of view. If yeah. you have an existing problem, then you have specific exercises that are that correct those problems and help you rehab. That's a different thing altogether. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, in your in your general training, if somebody is completely healthy and you oh, want to be able to address and improve stability while you're getting stronger, making better choices and exercises will definitely improve that. And they could be as ranging from adding a set of lunges or step ups into your leg training instead of doing five sets of squats. I would rather do three sets of squats and two sets of lunges because those two sets of lunges are going to bring an extra dimension of of benefit to my training than the five sets of volume of squat. Even though the quads are still going to get the same volume. Even though from a muscle point of view, the superficial muscle we see is going to get the same work, there is going to be an added benefit to it because it's training other sets of muscles too, which don't get trained very well with the squat, and it also gives other functional benefits. To me. And also, so basically, the big takeaway is uh, is moving away from you know two hand going to single arm stuff, like single arm, you know, like the uh, incline presses with dumbbells versus a barbell, uh, lunges instead of squats, like doing a lot of stuff. But not that instead, might- not instead. See, now in some cases. It really depends on the situation. It's the reason why, as a professional, when you coach somebody, you have to take decisions based on the situation. For example, if you're somebody who I, for me, the heaviest dumbbell in my gym is 120 pounds. Okay, um, I can. I have come to a point where I can comfortably lift 120 pounds in the recline press for multiple reps. If if I ever get to the point where I can do 12 reps and above with 120 pounds, now me staying with the dumbbell is actually going to stifle my progress. So in that case, I have to move on to the barbell. I know. Come on. That's, that's like an extreme example. I'm just talking about like yeah. in general. Another situation is you don't go lunges instead of squats. You keep them both because the squat also has a benefit compared to the lunge. But in some cases, like I could easily chuck out the flat bench press and keep decline dumbbell presses alone, and that works. So it really depends on a case to case situation whether you completely swap something out or you keep them along with something else and whatever. Got it. Uh, one, one quick thing I, I will notice, like I actually have gotten really into doing goblet squats and I think goblet squats, this is, this might be just purely my perspective, whatever. I think goblet squats are great because on top of training your legs really well and your hips, they also hit your core. Like if you do goblet squats like uh, with a 120 pound dumbbell or a hundred pound dumbbell, like your core is going to be worked and it also works your front tail. So I think it just like fucking hits everything really well now you, so let me bring you a let me bring a different perspective here every exercise that involves you loading your back or every compound exercise which involves you what we call as axial loading so there's loading that's on top of your body and you're lifting away is going to challenge your core it's going to work your core i would argue even more that you don't realize it but a proper back squat or a proper front squat and especially a proper overhead squat is going to train your core much better and much more oh, than yeah. you know it really it's just so all of them train the core firstly secondly the goblet squat if you now some people think okay i'm working my shoulders as well at the same time but the reality is that you're actually limiting how much weight your legs can lift because of your shoulders which is a smaller muscle group so you have to really look at the case by case and see is it worth meet keep perspective in mind you're there to train your legs train your legs the best way possible don't limit your legs by virtue of depending on your shoulder strength you know but the goblet squat is great from the point of view of improving Getting squat technique right. A lot of beginners who don't know how to squat properly, the goblet squat is the way to go to teach them proper squat mechanics. It works great there. But beyond a certain point, there are better choices available. Got it. All right, so let's see what else we got. What are your thoughts on low weight, high frequency training or low rep, high weight training? Okay, what's your goal? If your goal is to- Let's assume the goal for everyone is to get jacked. Yeah, if your goal is to get jacked, it's it's not the best way to go. Um, there's a certain level of resistance that you need, uh, a certain level of load that you need on the body for it to start prompting hypertrophy gains or muscle building gains or strength gains. And that tends to be tends to top off at the at, at most with 15 reps. But but uh, I would even argue in saying that anything over 12 reps beyond an intermediate beginner stage is we should kind of increase the load as opposed to trying to increase the reps simply because at, at some point the muscles switch between increasing the the tension that they have to or the force with which they have to contract they, it it goes from that to more like how many contractions can you do it becomes more endurance based training you know and you know, so there's a very clear like spectrum where what, what, what's, what's the ideal range is it eight to twelve or what do you personally recommend 
I would personally say six to six to ten is what. And so like, let's, let's say the eventual goal is to get there. But when somebody starts off, I would always have them start off at twelve to fifteen, so that they can imp they can because that stage is not about building max muscle. It's about learning tech, getting the basics right, getting the foundation set up. So start off with that, and then start moving towards from twelve to fifteen, to ten to twelve, and eight to ten, and then six to six to eight and whatnot. And also, well, for depends, someone who has some experience in the gym, basically, you recommend like six to ten. Once you get to ten, then you can increase the weight, yeah. drop them back down to six. And if yeah. you know, if you can't do six or if you can't do five, then you need to lower the weight. Or what do you think about yeah. that? Lower the weight, lower the weight, lower the weight, reassess. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's kind of the strategy. For most people that are watching this, for most people who don't get to that in late intermediate stage, following the basic principle of keep a rep range six to twelve or whatever and start with six or whatever maybe start with 10 get that way to 12 then increase the weight and then go from here there for most people it would work very well there will just come a point at some point where that progress is not going to be so easy and that's when you know a smart um, programming model would really help you break progress because i can't do that i can't go and lift you know, the way i do today and think that the next time i'm going to lift one more rep is going to be possible it's not possible for me you know because at my level so i have to like really my progression has to be planned weeks in advance but for most people watching, it'll it'll work. Just follow. Yeah, you gotta get you on that TRT, Sunny. You'll uh, you'll break through that plateau like fucking mad. I I will consider that the day you know I see the benefit risk to benefit analysis go in my favor. All right, what else do we have? But I will tell you this: your results have actually got me quite quite interested because um, you've actually gone about in, in a way that isn't necessarily what's. What's the way to go with the fitness circles? But you seem to be doing fairly well, you know? Yeah, I mean, my, my whole thing is, well, first of all, I feel like I'm not a good example because of all the underlying injuries. Like there's like for a long time, I had to really limit myself on a lot of lifts because of the injuries. I still do to a much smaller amount. I, I just I have to be more mindful. But no, so what I mean is what I mean is that your dose, your dosages and the way your body has responded to it and the lack of any significant side effects, you know, it's yeah, a great thing. I'm yeah, saying from that point of view. Most people would most people would consider your doses to be very like, oh, that's not going to be enough to work. But yeah. it's it seems to be working, you know? Well, the big difference is that I'm not doing a bodybuilder dose, I'm doing a therapeutic dose. So I never want to like I always want to have this is this kind of what my mindset on TRT is. I want to have the testosterone of a healthy 18-year-old who plays football, has no stress, gets eight hours of nine hours of sleep in a dark room. But I want to have TRT levels that are possible for humans. Like I don't want to go into like this, this fucking if, unfeasible if, territory. If I've ever been, if I've ever considered the, the idea of going on TRT, it's on after after looking at how well you're managing it and maybe from maybe emulating your. Because I was never, I've never found that appealing. I've never found it appealing to to um, get onto a full fledged cycle. So I've never even thought about it. Um, but but when, the way you've gone about it, it's like it's quite interesting. Because I what I thought to myself is. I'll get to a point where when my testosterone levels start dropping, uh, I, then I'll get on TRT for its purpose, which is TRT, you know. But until then, I, I don't want to. And I have another reason, and the reason is that I, since I'm, since this is a is a is a profession and a passion for me scientifically, I like experimenting on things that will give me more control on the variables. If I start putting in TRT, a lot of things that I apply and experiment on myself, which is in training or in training cycles and whatnot, I don't know to attribute that result to the cycle or to my to my training system, you know. Well, so, it's stuff. like you, once you lose, like basically people will just discount everything you do as TRT. Like, you, you, like if, yeah. if, if I was you, I would probably not do it either. I, mean, I don't know. Yeah. Actually, it's a, it's a tough call, but it's different for me because I'm not teaching fitness. So like, yeah. I'm not like, it would be, I don't know. Like there's not really a good analogy. It's not just for people discrediting me. It's more so for myself because I, I know the results that TRT can bring you. Like there is actually research showing that if you're on test, you could literally not train and still gain more muscle. Well, that's than not you get, you yeah, get more progress in the guy who trains who's not on Exactly, and it's it's shocking, but that's how it is. So when people look at guys with great physiques and they say, oh, the physique is what tells you whether this person knows what he's talking about, think twice because if he's on a cycle, or even worse, if he's got good genetics. Like I know a guy who hasn't trained for months. He's he's actually in the group, I think so. Uh, uh, he's in many groups that I'm in, actually. Uh, Roland, you know, shout out to you, by the way. This guy, he, he probably, he, he doesn't train for like months and he still looks better than... I would even if I'm training every day, you know. This guy is freaking amazing in his genetics. <laughs> it's it's insane. Um, yeah, this is a huge part. I mean, here's I also like the key thing is that I actually did have 
very low testosterone as a result of getting Lyme disease. So like I would only do it like if I had above average or normal testosterone, I would not do it. Like this was literally like, okay, my testosterone is fucking dog shit. And yes, sure. Once you are fully recovered from Lyme, it'll probably bounce back at some point, but like, do I really want to wait a year or two? Yeah. So that, that was like a huge component of it. Yeah, very, very few people know this, but you know, Alex and me worked through a time when he had um, his his neck issues really popped up a lot, and and man, it's like I could I could feel for him because you know, every time he tried to make some progress, he would just that thing would pull him back. So, uh, yeah, my so, first my first five videos on this YouTube channel, of me wearing a neck brace, I was one hundred and thirty five pounds. I looked like a skeleton. We were we were working together on that time where you know you you would keep coming to this, and I. You know, we tried so many things and every possible thing to really help fix that. And even um, I think you started doing physical therapy. Yeah, the big uh, now, changes for me were uh, stem cells and physical therapy, both of those things. But like those made a drastic difference. I, TRT also probably helped a bit, but it really was stem cells and then uh, and then just really good physical therapists who I worked with really closely. Like those were two right. things. That made up Gary that. has a question. Gary says, every day I do 150 reps of each push-ups, sit-ups, squats, and calf raises. Since I'm doing over 8 to 12 reps, is my workout a waste? Or is there still enough cardio benefits from continuing my workout? Okay, from the point of view of muscle building, um, you're not really getting much bang for your buck here. Um, you're not really doing much <clears throat> from the point of building muscle, so to speak. So if your goal is to build muscle, I would definitely reduce the reps and try to find ways to add weight. How can you do this? Well, you could, um, you know, like wear a backpack and like put some like books in there or whatever to start adding weights uh, and whatnot, or um, find alternatives. Uh, for example, a single arm push up could like is much harder than a like a regular push up. So working on that, or um, you know, or even single leg push up, those are pretty tricky. Huh? Yeah. Okay, but that's more like a more of a stability thing as opposed to resistance on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so a single arm push up or a single leg squat, you know, a step up or things like that. You can start doing movements which train the same muscles but like are harder. So then you know you you kind of like go into more of a strength zone as opposed to an endurance zone. Which comes to the second part of the question: Are there cardio benefits? Unfortunately, no. And you know, endurance is a very tricky thing. Endurance is something that uh, is very specific to the movement that you're doing, which means that if you're somebody who's an incredible swimmer, you've got amazing cardio for swimming and you can swim for an hour, you know, but then you put that same person on land and you have them run and they can't do the same. The same cardio won't work. Similarly, if you take somebody who is really good at running and they can run as much as possible, and you think that, hey, if he's now on in the water, he should have less resistance and he should be able to swim more, right? But nope, it doesn't work that way. So endurance is very specific to the, to the movement that you're doing. And when it comes to lifting weights, it comes, it falls neither in, in, it falls in the middle of nowhere. It neither gives you too much strength benefit and endurance. Think of it this way. Every time you run, you're performing thousands of contractions of your calves with your running. Is, is your 100 reps or 150 reps going to come close to that contraction? No. Uh, you sit in the middle of nowhere. You're neither getting well, a strength. Your, oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but what if your heart is beating really fast? Like you're literally like, he, like, uh, like you know, like this guy's the thing is doing 150 reps. So like he doesn't, his heart is fucking just jacked. Like you, you still feel like that's not enough, like in terms of cardio benefits? Um, no, it, <clears throat> if, if it is, if, it, if he feels exhausted, <clears throat> sorry, if he feels exhausted with that, it means that his cardio in and of itself isn't so great, which is why uh -huh. it's going to help him until it gets to the point where it gets better. But if you compare the two, if you take like really fast push-ups and you start taking in very ballistic movements and compare it to any form of basic cardio, which involves thousands of contractions happening over the span of time uh, and making and, and again is focused heavily on, on uh, you know, oxygen capacity and, um, and blood flow. Yeah. If, it, if, it is, if it is exhausting you, it means your cardio is really shit and you've got to work on it. Although to be fair, if I did 150 push-ups, I would be fucking exhausted as well. Same year, same year. And again, another thing why endurance is very specific to movements. This guy could be a champion at, at let's say, running, you know, and he could have amazing endurance. But if he does 150 push ups, he's going to feel that way because, again, endurance is very specific to the movement. That's so the, even, the Santiago just literally said exactly what you said. Hmm. He like basically is like gave the same answer that you did. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, best exercises for building a thicker neck. I, don't know who that's I like this, Michael, because a, a thick neck is actually one of the first signs that you somebody's jacked, and it's it's a massive difference in terms of your physique, and also adds masculinity to your overall appearance. Having a thick neck and big sh like, straps is really important to get that look. 
Um, if you really want to focus on direct, uh, you can start doing direct neck training. Uh, the way you can do that is performing neck flexions and extensions with resistance. Uh, you can, the simplest way to do it is to keep a plate on your head and you lay down on a bench and kind of like contract your neck against it for neck flexion. And the same by keeping a, a weight behind your head and doing neck extensions. But at some point, what will happen is you will run out of space or that or it'll be risky for you to keep that much weight in your head, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I would invest, I would invest in what's called as a neck harness. I actually have that. I bought that from Rogue Fitness. <clears throat> had it like shipped from the US. Uh, that would really help because it's a chain. It kind of helps you attach uh, a weight, uh, like a plate under it, or you can even attach to a cable cable system and uh, perform neck flexions and extensions with it. Another, another thing, I have this thing, it's funny you said, I have a thing called an iron neck. Uh, it's also, it's made in Texas, but it's like the same thing. It's a device you put around and there's like this thing and you fucking hook up. It's, I'm doing this purely for rehab purposes. I don't really give a shit about how thick my neck is. But yeah, that thing, like that trains your neck. Like you, you do like a few sets and like these muscles are just fucking jacked up. Like with these any, any way, any way that you can add resistance to neck flexion and neck extension is going to help you build a bigger neck. Another thing I would recommend is doing good sh proper shrugs. A lot of people learn shrugs the wrong way. They stand straight and they do this. That's not the proper shrug. You've got to like, I don't know how to explain it without like doing a demonstration. You squeeze your shoulder blades basically together, right? Sorry? You basically have weights and you squeeze your shoulder blades together, right? Uh, no, what you do is you, instead of staying like like this and shrugging this way, you kind of angle yourself forward and you pull your your shoulders back and then you kind of contract this way. So you're, okay. you're kind of, your your body isn't completely straight. Your hips are kind of angled forward. So when you're 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 kind of pulling it in that direction, it's a little hard to explain on on yeah, camera like this without yeah, demonstrating. But it's that's the actual proper way to do a shrug, and that will actually build the muscles that also connect to and add to that appearance of a thicker neck. Yeah, someone who's had a neck injury, I'll just say start slow, be careful because yeah. you don't want to you don't want to fucking injure your neck. It's such yeah. a neck. make sure that there's you're being very 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 careful with how much weight you use and how the contractions are. Like I don't recommend doing this. I never I hate that term squeeze the muscle, feel the muscle. But in this case, I would rather you do that than to lift as much weight. So like really feel those contractions and be very slow with it because this is not an area you want to fuck with. Oh yeah, dude. The first time you guys start off with this, because these muscles are weak for anyone who hasn't spent, like, unless you're like a NASCAR driver, and you're specifically or boxer, and you've trained this area. This is going to be so weak, like so weak. This part, yeah. These deep flexors. All right, neck curls. <laughs> when I approach somebody for a spot, is it appropriate to open with? <laughs> All right, you got, you got, you got, you got to say, hey, potential gym bro. That's a little too long, man. It's got to be like. Um... Hey, beefcake. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Listen, bro, no homo, but uh, I saw you doing squats from across the gym. I got to say, you know, your form, shit, man. Welcome to Real fire, real <laughs> fire. Yeah. All right. Ooh, the questions are starting to build up. This dude got rocked in the nose. <laughs> I feel like anyone who's, like, watching this and they, all they can do is think about my nose is probably on the homosexual side, so... <laughs> How about nutrition while working out? Nutrition while working out is an intro workout nutrition or yeah, no, no, no. what he's getting at is like, uh, you know, like how, what, what's your general philosophy on nutrition in general? I think it's just as important as training. Um, it has probably the reason a lot of people can train. Anyone can get their ass to the gym like five times a week and start lifting weights. You know, it's the nutrition where most people lose out. Uh, it's the nutrition where most people kind of drop the ball. Um, and nutrition is like a, a lot of people will just look at it as calories or X grams of protein or X grams of something, which is important. Mind you, it's very important that you get the right balance of macronutrients. But what you choose in terms of your food choices and micronutrients and and calories, right? Sorry, it's it's good to count calories, right? Yeah, it is because at the end of the day, you know, you if you really if you have a goal of building muscle or losing fat, you need to be in a caloric caloric surplus or a caloric deficit. Yeah, you know? and that's the that's like step one. It doesn't it doesn't guarantee everything, but it's step one. Then the next layer comes down to calculating the macros, starting with protein. You know, get the protein level like get your protein intake correct based on your body weight, based on your goals, based on um, you know, um, those two things, building muscle and your current body weight, you know, going, let's say 2.2 to 2.5 grams of protein per kilogram or one, one to 1.2 ish 
grams of protein per pound. Uh, we start with that. Now you've got your protein, you multiply that with four, and that's how many calories are set for protein. Now the remaining calories you have is split between carbs and fat, depending on the guy, the person. Because as, as somebody who does diet, um, the nutrition consultation and coaching, I, I look at multiple factors when deciding what the macronutrient split should be and what works better for one person versus another. What, whether they need more fat, whether they need more carbs, it really depends. So that's something that has to be taken account there. And then comes the next step, which is filling in those numbers with the right choices of foods. That will give you not only those calories and nutrients, but also give you micronutrients and will work to keep you full and help you perform better. So <clears throat> three layers, I would say calories, macros, and then food choices. Three main layers you need to consider. Um, most people, I would recommend um, getting a consultation done for this especially because what works, what is good for you, what is right for you, the exact amounts that you need to consume, uh, you know, what foods fit your preference and you can really put it together. How to arrange that with your daily schedule. These are things that a, a professional consultation will help you much more than winging it yourself. But if you have to do it yourself, go in that order. Calories, macros, and then food choices. Yeah, I think a really good app is My Fitness Pal. So you can log uh, exactly what you ate and it basically tells you how many calories is in that. You can find out exactly how much protein you had. So that app will make this whole thing like 20 times easier. I think that's yeah. a big thing. And also I think like sometimes I hear guys saying like, oh, dude, I just can't put on weight or dude, I just can't lose weight. But I guarantee every single one of those people, if they were in a calorie surplus or calorie deficit, they would either lose weight or gain weight. So I think that's what unfortunately it comes down to. All right, how much do you pay for your TRT? It's like super cheap. But TRT, the is one of the cheapest thing. Maybe like 50 bucks a month of that. Um, that's pretty good, man. It's, it's super cheap. Um, 80, yeah, so 80 for 10 weeks. So that's basically like less than 40 a month. You club, you club it, yes. So I do combine it with HCG. Uh, this basically mitigates some of the potential side effects, like it prevents your balls from shrinking, it prevents your body from shutting down and not producing its own testosterone. HCG is a little bit more expensive. I would say it's probably like 80 to 100 a month, but yeah, totally worth it. And honestly, uh, HCG is something that you can even do by itself. Uh, it, it can, it can, and some people it does increase testosterone. So if you're like on the fence about starting testosterone therapy and your testosterone isn't too bad, just start with HCG, do it for two months and then see where you're at. Like a lot of people will see a benefit just from doing that. It's a lot more natural. But I will say this, a lot of people who are watching and who haven't like first get your basics and your training and everything right then. Cause a lot of people who kind of try to use, you know, TRT or anything of that matter for as a crutch or as like a little shortcut, but. I would I would advise that you first get your basics right, and then if you ever at some point once you've stopped making great progress and everything else is going well and you really need to, then you can consider it. Yeah, I mean, just to be clear, I'm not actually recommending TR. I mean, I'm, you guys can do whatever the fuck you want. But I'm not recommending TRT uh, for training. I'm recommending it if you have actually low testosterone, right, and you've tried to fix that naturally, and you're having symptoms of low testosterone. Like for example, you know, like. You're just you're cranky. Uh, you know you're having a hard time getting erections, like stuff like that. Like you actually, you've got your blood work done. It's fucking low for your age. That's what I'm recommending TRT. I'm not recommending it just like a quick shortcut to get jacked. I'm sure, you can do that, but like that's I think really just a lot of guys you know, do have low testosterone. And I think the first step for them, I have a whole video on this, is basically to just see what they can accomplish naturally, and then you know if they can't, you know then you kind of consider HCG and then TRT. Oh, this guy said, I actually take agmatine sulfate for something completely different. Uh, L-Argentine, I've never tried. Uh, yo, yo, bro. All right, what's up, bro? It's maxing out hard pull, for example, once a month doing a bench press max out to see a maximum can lift one time as a personal goal, fun activity to abstain that goal. If you will, this question is purely for you, man. I don't know. Yeah, so you, when you test your 1RM, you test your max, it is something that uh, – your central nervous system, your entire like central nervous system gets really taxed the closer you get to 1RM. It's very exhausting. And if you keep doing that repeatedly, your CNS will get will get tired, which will result in you know some inefficiencies in lifting, and that can cause injury. You know, So I wouldn't recommend you. Uh, once a month is, is pretty decent. It's pretty OK. But at some point, uh, I would even say, why even once a month? You know, if you can, what you can do is you can test, uh, uh, let's say, a, a given month, find your current 1RM. Um, and then f follow a program that focuses on percentages and focuses on improving that 1RM over, let's say, four months or five months, and then test, you know, at the end of that, whether that 1RM is significantly increased. 
or even if not, uh, there are actually better ways to test close to one RM without getting that um, you know severe. If you can test a pretty solid three RM, you can still kind of calculate what your approximate one RM will be, which will be much less strenuous on your system, much less of a stress, much less chance of injury, but at the same time, kind of figure what your one RM is. If you're doing a test of three RM, I could say you could even do it every six weeks or something. Pretty decent, and it won't tax you so much. Yeah, my, my whole thing with all, one rep max is that uh, th there's a high chance of injury, in my opinion. Like, I personally wouldn't do it just because I have like I've had so many like injuries, and I feel like I still have like like kind of like scar tissue and shit. So I personally wouldn't do it. But maybe if I was like you know I never had injuries, then yeah, maybe I would give it a shot. The the thing is, it's not. It's you shouldn't be scared of it. You shouldn't be I'm afraid. Not scared. I'm not like, but yes, just like but, but yes, it, it doesn't make. It's why take the risk. You know, in many cases, most people don't need to. Uh, a three RM test. Oh, we're right next right now, bro. Yeah. Call me uh, out. And, <laughs> but yeah, and secondly, uh, it takes it takes a lot of like really dialed in technique because you know what? Um, on paper, your one RM could be X for that matter, you know. But when it comes to increasing and getting close to one RM, your technique it'll expose problems in your technique like this. If you've got some inefficiency, some technique problem at an eight RM, you can probably power through it. Like if I, for example, if I, every time I get into a squat, if I kind of like tip forward and then I move up, move up, if that's a problem in my technique, at an 8RM, I might not really feel that much because what will happen is, uh, you know, I'll kind of compensate for it because the load is not so much. But at 1RM, I cannot afford it. I will simply not be able to squat, stand up if I had that problem, you know. So it will expose these problems, but and if the problems are there and you don't know, are not aware of it and exposes it, that problem can cause an injury. So for most people, why go there? You don't need to. Right. All right. So I think this is the last question we have is, would you say it's possible to build muscle effectively with body weight exercises? Okay. All right. So first let's, <laughs> let's what? No, I just, I just, I just like how like, like, all, like you're like, so like fucking scientific and detailed, like, no, I mean, it, it's, these questions are very normal and naturally, I, I you know, and it's no, I got you. Because, because you know, it's, uh, it helps me, um, not, not really answer, but also shape perspective. And that's important here in this case as well. A body weight exercise is the same as resistance training. It's just that resistance here is body weight and not, you know, uh, an external weight in the form of, of a, a dumbbell or a barbell. For the chest, the chest does not know the difference between doing a push up and a bench press. The muscle does not know this is a body weight exercise and this is a resist uh, the uh, a weight. It just understands resistance put on it, you know, and body weight is resistance. So can a bodyweight exercise be as effective as, as the gym? Yes, but it depends on how much load that would be. In some cases, okay, for some people uh, who, are, who fall at a very decent level of fitness, push-ups could work fairly okay, fairly well. But if you're somebody who goes on either extreme, for example, if you're somebody who's very skinny or you're, you're like generally not very heavy, a push-up will not challenge you as much as somebody who's a lot heavier. You could easily do 20 push-ups, and then it's not going to be as effective as, let's say, a gym exercise. Similarly, you could be somebody who's a ranked beginner who could barely do like four, four push-ups, you know, and that's as equivalent as lifting a four rep max with a dumbbell, which is risky because that person is still a beginner. So it really depends on how much that body weight is on you and how what rep range it puts you in. If it puts you in a rep range of eight to twelve, it's effective, or six to eight, it's effective. You know, if it puts you beyond 12 reps, 15 reps, you need to add more weight. You know, it's not going to build yeah, much sure. as effectively. Yeah. yeah. And if it's going to put you under six reps, so it's going to put you too few reps compared to your level. If you're a beginner, you don't want to go ideally below 12 reps because it takes time to work up to the ability to train at lower reps. Then you might you might need to weight lighter than that. You, A, a woman, for example, a, a woman beginner is going to struggle very hard to do a push up. You know, I would rather she start with a five pound dumbbell and then grow up from there as opposed to start taking a body weight from the beginning. So it really depends on what that body weight exercise is and how many uh, reps you can do with it. If it falls in that sweet range, it works just as effectively. If it goes below, it's too heavy for you. And if it goes above, it's too light for you. Got it. All right, I, want, I want to actually end off with uh, one of my questions. So like, what are like your top, you know, doesn't have to be everyone, but like what are your big pro tips? like? these quick like things that you can say that are like, holy shit, man, that is going to be, you know, a big game changer for me or at the very least is going to help me. What are some like quick pro tips? Uh, okay. Um, tip number one, get a focus on a complete program, get a program, not a, not a set of exercises, big difference. 
collecting a bunch of exercises that look fancy, feel good, or even are effective, but just throwing them into a routine is not the best way to go. You need a routine, you need a system, you need a progressive, uh, you need a progression model in place because that's what's going to not only give you results, but actually keep you motivated. One of the main reasons why people stop lo lose motivation is because they don't have an objective or a, a mission to go in every single day when they go to the gym. And they start it starts getting monotonous very, very fast. You know, focus on getting a program that's designed from the point of view of covering all muscle groups, you know, that is designed from the point of view of progression. Whether you do it with a free program available online or whether you hire a consultant to make one that's specific for you, that's up to you. But get a program, not a collection of exercises. Big difference. Point number one. Project number two is nutrition. I know that people will keep saying this and they keep saying it because people just don't get their nutrition right. I know that a big audience from, from your from PWF now consists of Indians. And let me tell you guys, the Indian diet is completely, completely built against good health and fitness. You know, um, you need to reinvent the way you eat. You need to start getting the basics right. So identify if you want to build muscle, you've got to be in a caloric surplus. If you want to lose fat, you've got to be in a caloric deficit. Identify what the right macro ratios are for you. You can do it yourself by researching online or you can hire a consultant. I would recommend the latter because it just takes the whole thinking out of it and you can cover all aspects of it. But if not, if you can't afford it, fair enough. Start finding the calorie amounts you need. Then look at the macros you need starting with protein. Okay, and then go into carbs and fat, and then go into what foods will give you the best bang for your buck to get those numbers. Number two. And uh, the third thing I will tell you is more of a philosophical thing that keep in mind. And that is always be critical of where you get your information from. You will always find 10,000 people giving you 10,000 different pieces of advice. You'll always find somebody telling you, bro, this works and that works. Follow science, not the person. Don't listen to me because I'm jacked. Don't listen to somebody else because he's jacked. Listen to reason and, and ask the question why. Unless you ask why, anything can mislead you. I could I could show you my results and tell you, hey, you need to do something completely wrong. And you'll believe me, it shouldn't work that way. Follow uh, objective reasoning, follow evidence and follow science. And you will be better off than most people out there when it comes to getting your results. Yeah. Those are my three. I think great, there's there's some great resources on this. Um, what was the book I write? Oh, there's a book called Man uh, Alpha 2.0 or something like that, or Man 2.0, Alpha 2.0. It's a good book. It basically sums up your hormones, uh, training, fitness, like really well in one book. So definitely recommend that one. Uh, all right, Cindy. So if someone wants to work with you or just follow your content, how can they get ahead of you? How can how, how can they find you? How can they well, out? firstly, I, I have a YouTube channel. So if you, I mean, I haven't posted there for a while. I plan to again, but you can go and look up Sebastian Fitness Solutions or I have Alex put the link down below. Yeah, we're going to link everything in the description. Yeah, so you can go there. I've covered quite a few topics there. You'll be able to learn a lot from there for free. Um, you can always ask me a question uh, on there and I'll always answer whenever I get time. But if you want to reach out to me and get, get to work with me personally, I do offer online coaching and consultancy. That means if you want to get a one time playing with fire members. Yeah, yeah I'll get to that. Um, oh. But <laughs> but yeah, um, you can either get a one time program designed for me or get weekly coaching. Both Alex and Nathan have worked with me in the past. So, you know, you guys can think. And yes, for PWF members, of course, I've got, um, you know, a special discount because you guys are like family. Alex is also like family. So anyone who's part of this is no always going to be welcome. Yeah. And, and the code. Okay, for 10% off on my, if you want to really go and get my coaching, go to www.builtbysfs. I'm going to have Alex put the link as well. No, B-U-I-L-T by SFS.com. And anything in there that you go for, whether it's your, whether it's coaching or single programs or whatever, you get a 10% off directly using the code direct fitness attack. For the OG members who know exactly what this joke is about, you know, can go, can com comment down below. For those who know exactly what it is. I hope you remember what it is, Alex. Direct fitness attack. <laughs> so yeah, uh, that's the code, and you guys will get a ten percent off. And uh, yeah, it'll be a pleasure to work with you guys if you do decide to make that call. Awesome, thank you. And then, are you still? Uh, I think we talked about this like a long time ago. So, what was the thing for twenty four hours? If someone has a question, you'll answer them in the comments. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll do that. So for the next twenty four hours, um, after this video goes live, if there's any questions that you oh, guys sorry, post, right yeah, I mean, yeah, whatever. So right now, until the next, until twenty four hours. Any questions that you guys have for me, I, you can post them down below in the comments and I will answer each of them for the next 24 hours. Awesome. All right, bro. Thank you for coming on. Good interview. I enjoyed this Thanks one. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me, Alex. Always a pleasure. All right, man. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.